What if you had access to the same coach that professional athletes, entertainers, executives, and entrepreneurs had in their corner? If you're thinking that would make a huge difference, you're right. And that's exactly who we have on today's show. Today's guest, Brett McPeon, has helped executives, entrepreneurs, professionals, athletes, and entertainers discover their purpose and propel their careers and lives forward. Today, he's here to help us do the same, which is pretty amazing when you consider that many of the individuals and companies he's counseled have been recognized on the Forbes 400 and the Fortune 500 list. So it's pretty amazing. Welcome, Brett. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. So I got to, I mean, we'll jump right into it. Your company name, Rudius, uh, and just Rudius Strategies Group. But I'm more curious about the name Rudius. Uh, what does that mean? Where, where does that come from? Yeah, you know, um, it comes from an ancient uh, Roman tradition, actually. And it I, I first saw it in the movie Gladiator many years ago. And basically what a Rudius is, is it's a wooden sword. And what happened was, is that when gladiators were fighting in the arena, who were gladiators were basically slaves condemned to die for all intents and purposes. When they had distinguished themselves, if they had distinguished themselves, there was the chance that the emperor would touch them with this wooden sword. And when they did, it actually gave that gladiator their freedom. So Rudius Strategies Group is all about kind of helping people get their freedom or come alive is really what it's all about. That's amazing. Art, Arden should have known better with this because he's Gladiator's like his favorite movie. And I don't think I he knew like that. <laughs> Gladiator is my all time favorite movie is what convinced me to go into film school. So, and I know exactly what scene you're talking about. I just didn't know that's what it's called. So see, 24 years after the movie release, I'm still learning new stuff about that movie. <laughs> just to show you how good really Scott is, you know? So, uh, I mean, it looks like you've literally named your company around the concept of purpose and why. Um, why do you think more companies don't do this or take, take that into account? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I think that oftentimes, you know, there's, there's this, this feeling like maybe if I use a name that isn't all that catchy or that is too easy or anything like that, that, you know, companies maybe fear that kind of thing, or if it causes some confusion inside of things. I mean, my book is called The Delta Theorem, which I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. My publisher basically said, don't call it The Delta Theorem. <laughs> and I think that your guys' laughter probably tells you why they would you know, kind of say that, is that it has this thing of like, is this a book about calculus? Is this a book about, you know, what what is it all about and stuff? But, you know, you'll hear why I called it the Delta Theorem. And it's it's not the same as the Rudius Strategies Group, but I do believe that having a name that says something about what the content is, whether it be a book or a company, is important. And so for me, uh, Rudius and the whole concept of coming alive and winning freedom and purpose and why is so critical to what I do. And so, you know, that's why I, I chose to call it the Rudius Strategies Group. It got me thinking because I was wondering, I'm like, gosh, are there any other companies who do that much? Because I'm like, imagine, you know, Apple definitely would be called Apple if they were using that strategy. Um, they'd be maybe called Think Different. Who knows? Which would be compelling, actually. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't think of anybody else who's who's leveraged a name, you know, that speaks, you know, str so strongly to their the their purpose and how would they help other people. Yeah, I'm sure that there are. I mean, you know, like it doesn't really pop necessarily for me either right off the top of my head. But, you know, there are so many companies that are out there, obviously, that, uh, you know, c coming up with a name that that tries to say something about who they are is going to be there. I, I should have asked when you mentioned Gladiator, is that your favorite movie all the time, too? You know, it is. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a great story about that is that on my I think it was my 40th birthday. Yeah, my 40th birthday. I actually rented a movie theater and I invited about 50 guys and they didn't know what they were coming to see. And and I showed the film Gladiator and it was just, it was magical, quite frankly. That is it is, awesome. it's a 
you know, it's a fantastic film on so many different levels. So yeah, it was really great. Yeah, hopefully the sequel is going to at least stay close to the original as far as how good it is. Uh, but I guess we'll see. It's always tough, right? It's always tough to follow up on something like that. But Aliens did a decent one, and you've got, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Of course, actually, the Godfathers, you know, the Godfathers yeah. were amazing, right? Except for I'm not sure about Godfather 3. That one was a little bit a little bit off. But Godfather 2 was uh, an amazing movie, right? So, you know, there's hope for sure, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Would you say, kind of taking it back to purpose and why, would you say your kind of personal purpose and why is aligned with your business? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, I, I, uh, and I'd say it was a progression. Look, I'm 35 years through my career. I'm in the second half of my career, if you will. Um, I spent 35 years in, in, in handling the, the affairs of, as I said, a executives, entertainers, athletes, and what have you. And, and, in that course, look at I, I worked for some companies, some firms, and had less control about you know what my alignment of my purpose with the business purpose necessarily was. But it's always there. Right now, it absolutely is completely aligned. My personal purpose that I've come through is to inspire people to come alive. That's just the bottom line. That's my purpose. That's my powerful why. I want to inspire people to come alive. And the reason is, is because... I heard a quote many years ago and it said this. It was by uh, a gentleman by the name of Howard Thurman. And Howard Thurman said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do that. Because what the world needs is more people who are really alive. And I think that, that you guys doing a podcast understand that, right? You understand things like what makes you come alive. It's to do this podcast with people and encourage people along what is the right way and that kind of thing. You know, that's the reason why, you know, I got into writing the book and what I'm doing now. And obviously when you see uh, the, the Rudeus and the whole idea behind Rudeus about giving people freedom, having them come alive, you know, that's what, uh, that's where the alignment of my personal purpose and the business purpose, you know, line up, uh, right, lock and, lock and stuff. By the way, now I want to see Rudius behind you on the wall there, you know, sitting on a little. <laughs> yeah, right. Michael and I have debated this whole idea of like why and passion and purpose for many years. You know, we've known each other for over 20 years and it, it was always this, sometimes it's difficult to kind of hone in on your why and purpose because naturally you tend to want to go big. Like my why is to save world hunger. Obviously, that's just an example. But we've come to realization it doesn't have to be that. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not like a world-saving hunger type of why. It could be something small as long as you're aligned with it and you're passionate about it. But I'm just curious your thoughts on, on, on that. Like, How should somebody actually discover their why and not think that they need to save the world? Because... Uh, that's the, the why that's more, you know, talked about. Yeah, look, um, I think that you guys probably, like all of us, you know, thought about the why collectively because you know how important it is, right? You just know how important it is. But here's the deal that I have found in my coaching and working with people. If I ask them, tell me what your purpose is, here's what I usually get. I have no idea. I have no idea. And there's a reason for that. One, it's too big of a question to be able to answer. And two, because if I tell you what it is, then the option of it being different in the future is daunting to me. Like I need to come up with this thing that stays the same forever. That would obviously be the definition of purpose. That's what people think. But now you have this problem. People don't do the work, but they know how important it is. So I never start with purpose. I always start with what I call P cubed. And P cubed is I start with a person's priorities, their principles, and their passion. Okay, so let me go through that really quickly here. 
If I ask you, tell me what your priorities are. Tell me the things that are most important to you. You can come up with those. If you're a student, it's study. If you're in a career, it's your career. It's your family. It's your wife, your children, your you name it. We're able to identify. And by the way, priorities change with life events. When I'm single, my priorities are different than when I'm married, right? So they change over time. Then you can go to principles. Look, the deal is, is that if you don't live or have a set of principles that you know are the things that you stand for, they're the non-negotiables in your life, you are standing on shaky ground. Nobody wants to like say that they have no principles whatsoever. We all have principles. So teasing those out and where they come from and why they're important and are they really your principles and are they that important is another part of the process. And then finally, if I ask the question, listen, just tell me what makes you come alive. What are you so passionate about that you know in any situation that's what you need to do? It could be, I need to just lead. I need to make. I need to be behind the scenes. Whatever the deal is, that that's what makes you come alive then that's the passion. But the deal is that I have found is that it's not any one of those in isolation. It's all three of them. It's like when you take them and you put them in concentric circles, like Olympic rings, right in the middle, right in the middle where principles, priorities, and passion intersect, that's where the purpose is, right? That's where that one thing, that's where that powerful why is. Because, I mean, just think about it. If my principles are in conflict with my passion, then I, I got this incongruity in my life, right? I have no idea what I'm doing, that kind of stuff. But if they're all kind of like lined up and you say, oh, this, you know, this reconciles with my passion, this reconciles with my priorities and that kind of stuff, now I can find out what my purpose is. And guess what? Because priorities change over time, people's purpose can change over time. My purpose is very different today. Inspiring people to come alive, I wouldn't say that that was my thing in, uh, when I was 25. Not at all. My stage of life was completely different at that point in time. So I start with this P cube and say, this is the foundation by which we stand on. That's where your purpose starts to come out. And that's where people can start to figure out, oh, okay, it's not so daunting. Now it's just my life it, that's coming out of this. And now I can find out exactly what I think I need to do. I love the way you broke it down. I'm curious for, is it therefore probably less likely, do you think that people would have um, the stronger um, purpose when they're younger versus older because they're still figuring out what some of those things are to them? Or do you think it's equally likely that somebody would have a strong purpose no matter what age they are? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, um, with life experience comes more clarity around things, right? I mean, um, and so I agree with you that that maybe the the vigor, if you will, of a purpose when you're younger maybe is not as strong, but it's still, there's some things that are there that can make it very strong. Let me give you, for instance, when I, when I started um, the process of becoming a certified coach, it happened to be through an organization that was certifying via some work that was done by Navy SEALs, okay? And my coaching certification required me to actually do some physical kind of testing that along the lines of Navy SEAL. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not a Navy SEAL. I, I'm, uh, you know, again, that wasn't the intent here, but they basically said, look, it is mind, body, physical strength, all these things was what I was uh, trained up in the, in the coaching thing. In order for me to get through, I had to pass a 12 hour one day event that was formatted like Navy SEAL kind of hell week. And now 12 hours, not seven days. Yeah. <laughs> but 12 hours of chaos where they were testing in very unique ways. Just put it that way. Not dangerous, just unique because they wanted to see, did I build up? Did I, did I have the skills to be able to do it? It wasn't the day of the event that mattered. What mattered was at four o'clock in the morning when I had to get up and train for that event. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? Everyone else is asleep, including my wife. 
what am I doing? Right? I don't care if you're 25 year old or you're 50 years old or you're 75 years old. I had to have a very powerful why. And it came from what were my priorities? My priorities were to get certified. That's what I wanted to do. What were my principles? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. When I said yes, that was going to be my yes. And I was committed to that yes. And what was I passionate about? Inspiring people to come alive, right? So those three things came together. And my powerful why ended up being like, hey, I got to go out through this thing to train in order for me to do it. And my purpose for that time period was to get up at four in the morning to train myself so that I didn't get voted off the island. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. And I don't care if you're 25 years old or you're 35 years old or 50 years old. Those kinds of things are very powerful and strong. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm not so sure that necessarily age, you know, plays as much. Now, bigger, broader things in terms of like, now I know exactly what I feel like, you know, through failures and this kind of stuff can help guide you know, where I want to be and what I think I want to do, then then I agree with you that time does help on that front. Well, I mean, and then you obviously have individuals out there. It's easy to pick the ones that are in probably more of, you know, uh, media or people see. But when you do have the likes of the the Kobe's or the Jordans or uh, who's the gentleman now who just joined the Dodgers? Who's uh, Otani? Oh, Otani. Yeah. yeah. It's like, then there are these people, though, who feel like, Early on, they decided that this is that thing and this is where they're going to focus and, and do. And I think sometimes that can feel intimidating for individuals who are trying to find theirs back to a, a art and said, like, those feel like the big things, even though they're not world hunger, they still feel like really out of out of reach. And I think maybe that's sometimes where some individuals and again, art and I too, at different points in our life, it's like, oh, man, you know, like at one point we might have been like Spielberg, we're the next Spielberg, you know, when we were going into cinema and, and, and that side of um, things or the Ridley Scott's to shout out for, uh, you know, Gladiator. Right. But sometimes I do feel like it's it's that there's a struggle. Maybe I'm speaking a little bit um, for myself a little bit here where at times, and I don't feel this way as much today, but I had felt that way in the past. And maybe it's because of that changing thing too. If it shifts too frequently, then you may not be able to, depending on what you're aiming towards, make that same progress. Although progress is probably the reason why a lot of people also fall away from pursuing their purpose is as much too, because then they start doubting themselves um, as well. Sorry, I touched on a lot there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Look, I mean, I, you know, the Delta Theorem is 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 interestingly enough, the book I wrote, the Delta Theorem, is actually a math equation. Okay, and that's why I kept it as the Delta Theorem. Here's what the math equation says: Alpha over P cubed by E F squared equals Delta. And people go, well, what? <laughs> what? What the that's heck why is that? <laughs> right? What the heck is that? Well, we've already talked about purpose. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, right? And so in this framework or theorem, it's a, sh by the way, it's a shtick. It's, it's really, it's a shtick. It, it's not a math equation at all. It's just to help people remember the important elements. But alpha over P cubed is purpose sits on a foundation of priorities, principles, and passion. We already went through that. But look, all that stuff is all aspirational. I can go through it. I could tell you, I want to inspire people to come alive. That's what my purpose is. And I can write it in calligraphy, put it on a nice piece of paper, stick it up on my bookcase somewhere and look at it all day long and nothing happens with it unless you activate it. And that's where E comes in. Effort is the E. Alpha over PQ by E activation. You got to do something with it. I had to train my body to be able to pass that test. I had to train my mind to be able to do it. We all have to do that. You did, you know, in that early career thing, what you're going to do. And then F stands for failure. But it's F squared for the reasons of this. In math, well, first of all, we usually look at failures as negatives in our life. It's the way we look at them. In math, when you square a negative, it becomes a positive. And the concept here is, all right, I've now activated my, my purpose and I failed. Now what do I do? Do I quit? Do I, do I, you know, do I go in a different path? No, F square it. 
learn from it. That's the thing that, that happens here. You know, let's go back to passion. I hate the fact that when I went to my daughter's, you know, commencement address, it was follow your passion. Really? Come on, man. Really? I mean, it sounds great, except for the fact that I'm passionate about golf. But me too. I, <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm going to like take my family and like say, well, I'm going to go and like become a professional golfer. Come on, man. No, you cannot do that. It's not follow your passion. It's cultivate your passion. Look, I didn't start off to say I was going to write a book. But over time, when I read a bunch of things and I met with and, and worked with these really successful people, what came to be was that my passion for cultivating what I could basically give back to people was what that was all about. I didn't follow a passion of writing a book. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Write a book. It's terrifying. But cultivating that was a big deal. So, you know, long-winded around what I think you're talking about there is that, look, we go down these paths and sometimes we say, this is what our purpose is and it could be a career or whatever the case is. And then we fail. And like, what do we do with that, right? What do we do with it? Does it mean that that was the wrong purpose? No, maybe you have to cultivate somewhere else and you find out what you did like about that or what this business could do differently or what you can do better in your marriage or, you know, as a dad or whatever the case is, you know, all these things that come in. All of that, by the way, before I equals Delta. And the reason why it's called the Delta theorem is Delta is a symbol for change. So the whole concept here is, look, I know that what I want to do and what I think that we as human beings want to do is, is, is make an impact. We want to make a difference. Could be small, could be big, whatever the case is. And so what can we do to put ourselves in the best position, not guaranteed position, it, nothing's guaranteed, but the best position to make a difference? Well, I thought in looking at the, the congruent things with clients that I saw, things that I did in my life, things that I had read, that if you to have purpose, which is based on these three foundational things and you activate it and you learn from your failure, you're going to put yourself in a pretty doggone good position to make a difference in whatever sphere that you have your influence in. That's great. And I got to assume then, you know, the core of how you've been able to um, help, you know, individuals uh, across various degrees of success is being able to help channel and focus, taking it back to your three circles. It's almost like a lens, <laughs> making it so that laser can focus in a lot more. Because then when people do that, there's that coming alive since because and and they're living I don't want to say their best life, but you know, they're, 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 they're feeling alive. They're excited about things that they're pursuing and therefore life and all the things you're focusing on start to, um, ignite for lack of a better way around that thing. And therefore I would assume, you know, what you see is a lot more, uh, happiness and probably some over overall, um, I don't know, improvements on their well being, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I, there's a, there's a book, I don't remember the name of it, but they're talking about happier. Like we, we, we talk about, you know, I want to tell my, my daughter, I just want you to be happy, right? That assumes that like a starting point of zero happy, right? I want you to be happier, right? And, and that assumes that there's a foundation of already something that's there and the things that's there, what makes people happier are engagement, that you don't just do stuff by yourself, that when you share it with others, that that engagement is there, satisfaction with you, with what you're doing and purpose. That they found that those three things, when really kind of like worked on, they make people happier. Well, that's along the lines of everything I've just talked about, right? I mean, it is right down that alley. And I'm not gonna tell you that you're gonna be happy I'm going to say, look, I think that you're going to be happier if I, if we work together around this kind of thing, you know, inside of that. So that's what I do with my clients and, you know, work with them and there's accountability, you know, just doing it by yourself again, no engagement, right? I mean, no engagement. And so it, it just becomes hard and, and you're going to quit and, you know, these kinds of things. So yes, it's all built in there. And then accountability piece that you said, cause that was going to be my next question, because I feel like oftentimes you know, as people do, again, I'm trying to use your circle thing here for a second, but it's like, 
it's easy for those to start almost pulling and drifting away. And then you lose that focus a little bit in the middle. And granted, as you said, some things might change, but what does that accountability look like that helps people stay, um, you know, well, I don't want to say stay driven towards their, their purpose, but in essence does help them focus on that while at the same time giving enough flexibility for when some of those um, P's might change. It starts in the beginning around making sure that what people are saying around their three P's are actually their three P's. That's accountability there. So I can say something like, okay, tell me what your priorities are. And they'll say, my family. And yet I look at their their calendar and they don't come home from work. That's all like, of our default is aspirational. Right. We're like, that's right. or we feel we that's should be at least. Exactly, here. exactly. What somebody told me I should be. Tell me what your principles are. You know, are they really your principles? I mean, really your yes be yes and your no be no? Uh, well, then how come I asked you to do something you didn't do it? Like, is it really your principles around that kind of stuff? So it starts with asking the question, hearing the response, and then making sure that it actually is something that that person owns, right? And when they own it, then it starts to come into, you know, um, uh, it, it, it starts to play itself out in the actions that are taken. Look, the thing is, is that I believe too, is that all this really does is it makes it easier to make decisions. We come to force in the road every single day. Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I take that job? Do I not take it? Do I apply to this one? Do I not even listen to something? Like, it helps you make decisions. And then sometimes those decisions don't work out. That's F. That's failure, right? But then you learn from it and you move on from there. And so it's working with somebody around that accountability to say, okay, what did you do? What, what have you done with this? What, what kind of efforts are you going to do? Or you, with my clients, I actually put together what I call a six facet training plan. Like I had to get up in the morning at four in the morning. I had a training plan that I did. Well, sometimes people can't figure out what their training plans are. So I help them around that. We set some goals. And then from there, I work with them around that kind of thing. And it's their plan. It's not mine for them. It's their plan, right? That's the deal. In a scenario like that, though, so what happens if, um, if you do find somebody who's coming in and saying that family one? Because maybe they do want it to be that, but the reality is right now it's not. Do you help them try to focus more on incorporating a family or do you try to actually say, Let, let's, not, let's not add that to this now. Let's keep focused around the things that are your priorities to unleash that because then there's going to be a reverberation and a benefit that might end up hitting those as well. Like, What's that look like? Yeah, look, I, I let them put together their plan, their action steps, right? Okay, look, this is what this is what it is. It's family. All right, tell me what one action step that you're going to do around this kind of thing, okay? And it could be I'm going to do a date my date night with my wife or, you know, I'm going to get home by 6 o'clock or whatever to, to have dinner with my family, whatever the case is, right? It's theirs, right? It's their, their plan and that kind of thing. So we go with that. So, yeah, look, I mean, then it's their plan, right? Then they come back. They didn't do it. Yeah. Right? They, they, they didn't do it. And so that's where the opportunity to ask them, is it really that important to you? Why did you stay late? Come on. It's okay for you to have career as like, you know, your top priority. It, it's, it's okay. Like if that's what you really feel that it is. Now, certainly you're going to have to reconcile that with family, like your wife or whatever the case is to be able to talk about that. But then that's the next step, right? Like then talk with her about this because what you're doing is, is that you are afraid to continue on in your career. And now you're just hiding, you know, and you're, you're like trying to get all the work in, but you can't, and you're just not happier as a result of that. You know what I'm saying? So that's where that kind of thing comes into play. Interesting. Do you find that um, there's people are, striving to find a purpose that fills um it's sort of what Artin was pointing out before a little bit larger and a little bit you know bigger or do you find that people actually do hone in on something that not not to call it smaller but that is more immediate um you know again family versus uh, you know Tony Robbins however many thousands or millions of people he wants to feed like as his goal do you what what do you normally typically see or does it vary big Everyone starts big, okay? So 
and and it's just like I know that that's going to be the case, right? So here's what will happen is is that they will start off by saying I'm going to do three date nights this next week. And I'm like, yeah, right. You haven't done one, you know, like forever, right? I don't say, no, you're not going to. I have to let them experience that it's not that they're going to have accountability inside that, right? And so usually what happens is that they realize that these grand ambitions, these grand purposes, these bigger things that they feel like that's the only way that I can make a difference, that I can make a mark in life, that's called sprinting. But what I try to remind people after they sprint and fail is that we start by crawling and then we walk and then we run, right? So you start with a small business as crawl that grows into, if you want to, a bigger business that is walking, that grows into something more ambitious because now you've got this kind of like, I'm walking, I've got momentum. Now we can start sprinting, right? Now we can do that kind of thing. So crawl, walk, run is a critical component inside of this. How do I, you know, make sure that the expectations and even like what people set forth to do in their purpose or their mind or that kind of stuff really comes to reality. I let them run though. Let, let the, let the line go out because inevitably it's not going to work and they're going to come back and they're going to say, all right, I want to do it. And by the way, if they don't want to come back, then it's their plan. It's not mine for them. I'm here to help them, right? So all I can do is say, look, okay, keep trying to run. God bless you. Good luck. You know, that's that's fine, but it's not it's not happening. So maybe the priorities will realign and they'll find themselves back to focus on. That's exactly correct. Then the priorities realign because they always do. Right. They always do. That's what I found. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I put those in there. These are not like ideas that are like, you know, some brilliant thing I came up with. I just came up with this like kind of framework that makes it easier for people to like think about how can I do these with these six elements that can make it, you know, easier. But they still play themselves out. They always do. And that's why, you know, I, I it's been successful in my life and in life of my clients. Brett, you uh, obviously touched on this, but we've also talked about the the level of folks that you've helped uh, pretty successful in their own right. What similarities do you see between those that have reached a level of success that majority are kind of aspiring to get to? Yeah, look, I mean, it doesn't really matter if we're human beings, right? I mean, let me step back. We're, we're just human beings. I was not my clients. Okay. I, I went home, not to the mansion. It's just, that's the way it was. I was in that world, but that was not what I had. But my human condition was no different than what I found that they were. And here's what it was. I'd get up in the morning. I would kiss my wife, uh, take my daughter to school, they'll walk the dog or whatever the case is. And then I would get on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles, which is not a freeway at all. It's a parking lot, parking lot. <laughs> in the morning. And I would sit there and I had this sigh that I'm sure you both have had at times and my clients had. And that sigh looked like this. Is this it? Is this it? Like, there's got to be something more. There's got to be a larger story that's going on here. My clients had the amount of capital financially, success-wise, that you would not have to worry about like the larger story. They had larger story finances. But here's what I found. They never asked me about the money. They asked me about things like this. What's the money going to do to my kids? Or... How come I don't have peace of mind? Or why is my physical, like, I just don't feel that good. I, I feel like I should be feeling better physically. Or why do I not feel like time is my own? Right? I bring those up because what I found was that success or what I call true wealth 
were made up of much more than just financial. They were made up of relational wealth, spousal, kids, friends, colleagues. You're wealthy when you have great engagement with the people around you. That's what I wanted. That's what we all want. That's what my clients wanted too. It made up of mental wealth, which is when they were like, how come I don't have peace of mind? It made up of physical wealth, which was, why am I not feeling so great? It made up of temporal wealth or the wealth of time. And so what I found was that when I was working with clients, I would work on that component of wealth management, right? Because there was those things. And when we like got into this like whole true wealth component stuff, then the larger story starts to come about then I know that my money is doing something for someone else or that I'm relationally great with my, with my son or whatever the case is. So that's the part where, you know, those things coming together really made a difference in terms of working with these, you know, these clients that you'd think they have it all. No, no, they don't. They're human beings. They might have more money than, than people, but they still don't necessarily have the relational wealth or the time wealth or whatever those things are. I love that. And it, you know, makes you think a lot about because the term wealth management is generally firms that are helping people manage their money, not actually manage in terms of all those things that you mentioned. And it's like, huh, (laughs) that's, you know, that combination there is even a lot more powerful because you are, you're thinking about it beyond just that piece of, um, yeah, whether or not your money's growing for you, what is happening there, you're thinking about whether or not you as a whole individual are, uh, I mean, I, I, I go back to the happy term fulfilled, however we want to say it, happier, you know, moving towards it. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Would you find then that normally what, um, and maybe in your, your previous life, especially the type of clients that had that wealth, it makes sense that they were probably, um, had, you know, more years under their belt. But today for those who you're helping as much, do you find that again, people call it, whether it's midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, whatever, do you find that there's a certain time when more um, people come to you looking for help or does it vary? You know, it varies. um, But I'd say that the older, older clientele is more attuned and aware that these kinds of things are the like, huh, that's where the sigh kind of comes in, right? Uh, Yeah. Um, There's got to be something more here because I've lived a lot and like, I've reached the pinnacle and it's like, I still feel like, really, that's it? And by the way, like, uh, my story's large, just like your guy's story is large. I mean, they are large stories. They're just in the whole scheme of things, kind of small, and we kind of know it, and tapping into that is important. When you're younger, you know, look, you, you just have so many years more ahead of you and you know it, and you're willing to just to throw caution to the wind and, like, be able to do it, right? And then the failure started to happen. And then it's like, maybe you do have some success, but then you realize like, oh, really? This is it. Like, there's got to be something more. So that study they do each year that looks at happiness across uh, countries. And again, not to make it on happiness, but it was still interesting as it relates to this is they, you know, U.S. just finally fell out of the top um, 20. um, And a leading reason was they said Gen Z, so younger generation are actually, you know, uh, less happier. So I, I, I can't help but wonder, you know, whether or not there will be that shift. I think COVID, all those things to more people who are looking at more purpose. I mean, Simon Sinek popularized, you know, concept with his book, Start With Why and those things. But I think now between pandemic and between, again, the fact that it feels like younger generations are thinking about what it means for them to live a life of purpose or on purpose, up. I'm curious to your thoughts on whether or not you think more should be done to teach this topic in, say, you know, the colleges or even before that. I, I mean, I wrote the book for that particular reason. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, the dedication of my book, you know, probably not surprising, is to my daughter. I have a 26 year old daughter, right? And the reason why I wrote the book in the first place was really it was for my daughter. Uh, like, I want her to to be able to determine what her purpose is by just exploring her three P's and then understanding what the effort it takes to be able to really kind of do this stuff and then also give her the freedom to be able to fail, right? I mean, if you never want to fail, 
guess what you have to do? Never risk. Well, I'll guarantee failure is like gone from your life, but I'll guarantee life is gone from your life when you don't risk, right? I mean, you got to risk and that's when failure could potentially come. I did that for her. I personally, you know, this is self, self-promoting, but the reality is, is that put this framework in the hands of a parent. Put this framework in the hands of a coach. Put this framework in the hands of a teacher. Put this framework in the hands of a supervisor in work. Put this framework in anywhere. These are all elements that we all kind of know are like, mm, yeah, like priorities and principles and passion. Mm, I get that, right? I mean, and this is, I, I just happen to like piece it together in a way that I try to make it easier for people. So yeah, I, I do believe that being exposed to these things is very important. Here's the things that are like kind of coming up. Number one, we are not coming together. We're actually becoming more, it seems like, independent. And through our phones or, you know, social media, we think that we have friends. And frankly, we're just sitting there by ourselves, right? We're not really engaging from that standpoint. So nobody is there to walk people through these things one-on-one. -on -one. Like, let's walk through this kind of stuff. And, and you know, that's really, really... I think very, very critical in terms of, you know, walking somebody through it and, 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 you know, why it's, it sounds self-serving. I don't mean it that way at all. I truly, I want other people, I like, grab this stuff and say, okay, I, I can show this to somebody else because I've got, you know, these experiences that I can share too. Has your daughter read the book or she instead just picked up the pieces from you as you've delivered it? Cause uh, yeah, I'm asking, as I look at my own kids younger at times, I'm like, you know, uh, God, how do I get them to you know pick that up and read it? She's read the book. Uh, she has not proactively sought me out to be able to do this. But, I mean, you can probably guess that I proactively seek her out to do it. Look, we have to be purposeful, like, you know, in parenting and stuff, to think that our kids are going to come for us and say, Dad, tell me the secrets to it ain't going to happen, right? Me saying to her, hey, Brooke, you know what? I'm seeing that you have this. Have you considered this kind of thing or whatever the case is? Like, maybe you should figure out, like, what are your priorities right now? Like, what what are those things? And it's about decision-making for her, right? It's about decision-making for all of us. How can I make better choices in what we're doing? So, yeah, that's, that's really what it is. I do love it. I think a lot of times when we, uh, people get in their own heads, you know, and being uh, fearful or what have you, it's usually because there's a lack of, um, a clarity and a lack of priorities. Like how do you do what you want to do? And then what are the priorities that you want to do? So I love what you've explained because it's just really breaks it down and what you've created and like a better way to put it helps people with that, um, prioritization framework and a level of clarity, um, that I think is so powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, yes, it, it, I, I did it because it works for me and, and it worked for clients that I, that I walk them through, you know, and it does, I do think it takes another party, like a coach, to help you know people inside there. Because what can happen is, is nobody tests what your priorities are, and there you don't really know if they are or not. And when you tell somebody something, and then you have to like prove it, then you really find out whether it's true or not, right? And that's where it really just comes into play. I always use golf as my analogy for that, Brett, because unlike most other sports. If you just try to go play golf blindly, you're going to hate it. You definitely, need, you definitely need a coach to just at least tell you a few things to make it fun. Uh, so I use golf as an analogy all the time just to talk about you need somebody that is a few steps ahead of you just to show you the rope. So at least you have a foundation uh, and you're not spinning your wheels and trying to figure something out. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm totally with you because I'm in the midst of of really kind of trying to I'm trying to hit the ball straight. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> having a coach to tell me what I'm doing wrong, right, is good. Here's the challenge that I'm fighting. I'm sure that you are too. As I'm standing over the ball right now, I'm thinking of five different things that he's told me. And my body can only think of one at a time, right? And so it's really hard. But the joy, the joy is in a couple things. One, I want to do it. 
like I, I, I want to do it. That's where the passion kind of like comes into play, right? I want to do it. And number two is progress. Like when you, the things that I was thinking about last time, my backswing, I now have muscular uh, mem muscle memory to be able to like have that one be less of me having to think about it, you know? And, and so progress happens. It happens. People like might start off and say, I don't know what my purpose is. It's too big of a question. And I don't know why I ever got there. Okay, let's just start out small. <laughs> and then you can see like, oh, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, like after time goes on, the successes come. And I hit one that feels really good down the middle. And, and I think to myself. Great. <laughs> on the, the whole 16. Exactly. <laughs> Just breathe me back. <laughs> you know, by the way, Eric, you guys like me where it's always my best shot comes on either 16 or 17. Yeah. <laughs> because it makes me want to come back tomorrow, right? Yeah. I am just yeah. dreading it on six, seven, eight, nine. I'm like, oh, guys. I was going to play. But that's why I like to play the um, nine holes instead because then usually for me at that point, it's like, all right, I'm not. By the time I get to the end, for me, yeah, for, forget it. But I will say on that metaphor too is, um, I think the challenge in a lot of people will face, and again, where that um, coaching comes in is when you learn the wrong approach to it, it's sometimes it's even harder to undo that. And speaking to my golf game and any poor coach he has to work with, you know, me at times, they're just like, ah, and back to what you said, when you're trying to think of all those, knowing that that failure, you know, as you mentioned, is a piece of that is okay for some, but the idea is are you making progress on some of the other pieces? Because when you do, it all starts to eventually uh, come together. But the mindset side of it, or rather the, um, yeah, just the components in, in the way we get in our own way. Just like, you know, at least if you get that hit, you know, down towards the uh, one of the last remaining holes, it feels good. It keeps you coming back. But if you don't get some of those wins, you sometimes feel like giving up on it. And that's where I think having that right um, person in your corner who can help you overcome those moments can be so critical. Yeah, look, um, interestingly enough, what I have found is that some of the worst things have been some of my success. Because I start to think that in that success, it becomes my identity, that success, right? It's almost like an elaborate fig leaf, right? That I, that I can use like successes sometimes, I mean, not always, but sometimes they can end up being the things that are like the muscle memory into something that was not what you really wanted to do, right? And you get on this path where you are miserable but you've been so successful around that particular thing that your success has been that muscle memory that brings you a lot of things but it's not really what brings you that happier kind of like engagement you know satisfaction and fulfilling a purpose that you kind of know what's there so it's it's kind of interesting from that perspective we obviously talked a little bit about parenting how often have you come across where uh, in your coaching where somebody starts grand, but after one, two, three sessions, however number, they kind of come to an understanding of, you know what, my purpose is actually to be a parent, a dad or a mom. Like how often does that happen? Not often, honestly. I mean, it's not that like people necessarily shift that significantly. They don't go from, you know, the success of like, hey, I think that my purpose is my career. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's like being a dad. It is more of a little bit of a balance inside of what starts to happen, right? That that they they engage more with priorities that are not as high, but are 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 high as well. What more happened is that people start to eliminate some priorities that shouldn't be there. Do, do you know what I'm saying? They, oh, yeah, absolutely. they think that like this has to be a priority and they have five or six priorities. And what really can happen is that they eliminate three of them. They focus on three and they really supercharge those three. And that's what brings them, makes them happier inside of what they're doing. That's more the thing than they, you know, throw one off and bring another one up or whatever the case is. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, something that stuck with me from, James Clear, as he talked about, I think it was the four burners in this concept that, you know, whether it's family, whether it's career, whether it's health, uh, whether it's friends, you know, 
Uh, it's like you only have so much gas to give and people are trying to give, you know, enough to each one of them. And when you do that, well, then you're not really burning on any of them fully. And it's like versus the reality of it is we may go through periods where we turn up this burner and then later on we may turn up this burner sometimes in people's lives. But if you if you are, not then sometimes you might not be, you know, uh, giving in enough fuel to actually, again, make that progress. That also is is giving you back that that sense of accomplishment or, or, or purpose. I say all that and you're the, you're the pro. So, you know, <laughs> I totally agree. Right. I mean, I, I yes, I see it and, and totally agree. FOMO is a big deal, right? I fear of missing out on any one of those priorities and that kind of stuff. And yet what I found is that when I was able to push aside some of these other things and just focused on this, that the things that I really did focus on, because they were really important to me, they just flourished. My relationship with my daughter is rich. It's rich. And I love it. I dig it. I know she does as well. My relationship inside of writing the book is rich. You know, that's what the deal was. I retired out of a very, very successful, you know, career at what some people thought like, wait, what? You're too young on this. Why are you doing this? Like you're like that kind of thing, because that was not my priority at that time. Right. I didn't feel like the, my purpose was inside of that in there. Now it was, and I could make my purpose there. And I did while I was there. I inspired people to come alive when I was there, but it was just a different kind of like season for me that I shifted into because it became something that I wanted to do different. Totally get it. I'm there today. It's exactly for me. It was like, all right, you know, uh, a few years ago, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll done with that chapter. I've done corporate America side of it. Time for my entrepreneurial side of it. Excited about this and the progress there. And um, yeah, I could see for me the difference of my happiness, the difference of anxiety I was feeling previously because I wasn't, for lack of a better way to put it, almost congruent with who I wanted to be versus who I you know, was. There was that, that, that thing that I was hitting. So anyway, I absolutely relate. Brett, th this has been... Uh great, great conversation. To kind of wrap it up, uh, if anybody is watching or listening and is struggling to kind of find their why or purpose, what are like one, two, or three things they should do today to kind of step in the right direction? Well, I, I would say buy the Delta theorem on Amazon. That would be the first one to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's brand new. <laughs> um, we'll make sure. We'll, we'll link to it. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. Self-serving, self-serving. But you brought it to do that. So <laughs> you brought it to help. I mean, it makes sense. It's like, yeah, I, I would say, I'd say a couple things mindset wise. Crawl, walk, run. Okay. Crawl, walk, run. Don't sprint. Take your time. And take your time inside of clarifying your priorities, your principles, and your passion. Look at those things. From there, you find somebody they can help you like, you know, kind of work those things through. It doesn't have to be me or a coach or whatever. Just like talk to somebody about these things because what you want to be able to say is, I want to make a difference. I want to come alive. And right now I'm not sure how to make the decisions inside that. And I do believe that having my powerful why clarify these things is where I should be going. So that's what I'd say. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, great advice. Well, where can people find you? You know, I made it relatively easy. It's connectwithbrett.com. Okay, it's a landing page that has links to my website, the Rudia Strategies Group website, to my book, to offerings, to all various things, a newsletter. Um, so connect with Brett with one T on the end, B-R-E-T dot com, and they can land there and they can get in touch with me. Man, you say that, I'm like everybody else out there. It's like, quick, go get your website, connect with. Yeah, I'm sure you yeah. <laughs> wanted to be even thought about that. So that's great. Again, thank you for uh, for joining us today. Uh, and if you know anybody that tuned in, uh, comment, share, uh, and help us out to spread the word. Thanks again. And we'll see you on the next one.